<laughs> Sorry. All right, this is time when we can take some uh, questions from the audience or even from the panel members among the And what I'm going to ask those who come to the microphone to say, um, uh, to state who they are, uh, where they're from, or what institution they represent, and if they have any significant conflict of interest. Okay, Dr. Weisfeld. Um, Mike Weisfeld, Johns Hopkins. <clears throat> A question for Dr. Dawson. Has anybody developed or thought to automate dispatcher-assisted uh, CPR, uh, similar to what we see for making an airline reservation on the telephone. Uh, it seems to me like you could get rid of uh, the variability. You could have uniform performance. Obviously, the dispatcher would need to listen as the recording was played, and the person would need to try to respond to go to the next step. But it seems to me that uh, that, that has a significant potential, at least, of getting rid of the need for instruction largely, as well as the uniformity and the forgetting of the dispatcher under the stress of uh, providing uh, advice. I can't answer whether that uh, has been done or not. Uh, however, I think one of the um, advantages of the, the interaction between the PSAP call taker and the person is to be able to kind of individualize that. As I listened to some of the tapes and I actually went through the online training program from Arizona myself, <clears throat> um, that part of it is the being able to calm down the caller, to be able to listen to what is going on at the scene, to be able to, um, to hear what's going on with the patient, to be able to determine whether there are agonal respirations or not, and whether that kind of how that fits into the equation. So um, I, I don't know whether it's possible to automate that. I can't say that it isn't. I don't know whether that's um, been played out in any of the um, uh, investigations or not, but it seems like it would be a rather difficult thing to do. Um, what I do think is possible, though, is to use technology to be able to get the call to people who do that frequently in a high volume situation and who become very, very proficient at doing that so that not every dispatcher needs to know how to do that and that, they ha and that not every dispatcher, the dispatchers who very occasionally have to do it may not become as proficient at it. And it seems to me we may be able to get people into a higher volume, high proficiency situation through the use of improved technology, particularly as next generation 911, we're ways off from next generation 911 being fully implemented across the nation, but as that becomes fully implemented, I think it provides more technological solutions to um, get dispatcher assisted CPR, TCPR, um, more widely implemented. Uh, Bob Berg, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and uh, former chair of the BLS Committee for the Heart Association, and we came to the same conclusions that Drew did, that if you, and that uh, Art did a few years ago. That by far the the, the uh, most um, uh, exciting potential, low-hanging fruit, however you want to look at it, way to make a difference in denting the uh, uh, survival rate is the telephone-directed CPR um, mechanism. That uh, many many, as you mentioned, uh, it, it, uh, Art, there's a two to three-fold increase in survival rate, and that uh, in many cities, uh, over half of this bystander CPR given uh, in many of the, the best places are telephone directed, and that uh, it's not just giving it, but it's doing it right, and there's been some nice papers written by um, Ben Bobro about this, some position statements when he was in that position. I love the excitement that I got from Art there. That's fantastic. We have wide variability in outcomes for something that makes a real difference. Survival for our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, and our fathers. Here's two things that you mentioned that are really, really important today. One of them is, is we, we can do something better across the country, and, and we need leadership from something like NHTSA to, to do this. We have to make sure that that happens here or we've really failed. And, and number two, we gotta measure what we're doing. I heard sort of in the um, uh, in-hospital in thing, I should have opened my mouth, was, well, there's a lot of ifs and ands and buts about how we measure. 
survival rates that, that are twofold difference are not only because of, of a few changes of denominators and numerators. We ought to know if we're near the bottom or we're near the top. We have to measure it out of hospital and in hospital. And, we, and, and th these are doable things that we should not allow to happen without, um, uh, at the end of this. We should make sure we measure what we're doing and it gets back to us publicly. And we should uh, do something about telephone directed CPR to make it a standard way so that every place does it just as well as they do it in Seattle and, uh, and Portland and, um, uh, and, and in Arizona and a few other places. Every place should be able to have that, this simple thing done for them. I appreciate your comment. When my colleagues and I in Memphis did the second study after Mickey Eisenberg and colleagues looked at telephone CPR in Seattle many years back, and that was when dispatchers were not only teaching how to do compressions, but ventilation, airway, et cetera. And what we found was that the telephone subjects did compressions just as well. It was the ventilation part that was complicated. So now that we're really comfortable with compression only or hands only CPR, telephone CPR just makes that much more sense. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, I think we could double or triple cardiac arrest survival rates in this country in 24 months. Yep. If we walked out of this room together and said we want to have universal accountability, a relentless focus on bystander CPR, an optimal paramedic performance when they get to the scene with early defibrillation and cardiovascular resuscitation. That's an achievable goal to make a profound impact and then give the public the confidence and the excitement to support the kind of research agenda and continued improvement that we all envision in this room going forward. Jim Augustine, EMS Medical Director, no conflicts. Uh, the four of you, what a, what a tremendous effort all four of you have, have made in improving emergency medical care and outcomes from cardiac arrest. Uh, in, uh, in looking at telephone assistance and the ability of the 911 centers to improve operations, there, there's a real elephant in the room, and that is uh, 911 centers in general are owned by a branch not well represented in this room, and that's law enforcement. And we are getting more and more divergent in the, in the communication needs of fire EMS and law enforcement, and yet in most communities, it's a law enforcement responsibility. Doctor, don't come and tell me what I need to do. And we have gotten to the point where, where the use of this um, is better if you walk around the 911 system. So you have a cardiac arrest. Uh, why don't you call this 10-digit uh, number, FaceTime with them, and they can visually uh, work you through CPR better than I can on the phone uh, through the 911 system. And after recent events like Orlando, uh, where they're recognizing the need for text and visual uh, keys between uh, responders and, and what's going on inside a building or something, uh, we, really, we really have a gap in how we can improve the 911 system. Do, do any of, of you have suggestions and what should we go home with in trying to improve our 911 center operations when we really don't own that function? Well, <clears throat> Jim, for, first of all, good comments. I think that, um, I think, first of all, communication is the key, and communication, <clears throat> most, <clears throat> excuse me, most of improving um, the 911 system is not about technology. There are technological gaps, and, and I can talk about those in just a minute. There are technological gaps. Most of the gaps are people-to-people -people gaps and relationship gaps, and that is on a, on a community level, sitting down, well, regardless of who operates the peace app, whether it's law enforcement, fire, EMS, or whoever operates it, sitting down and working through those uh, relationships, working through those protocols, working through those issues at the beginning, and uh, and and addressing what those what those issues are and how those protocols are developed. So I think those are are uh, operational gaps that can be worked out at a, at a local level. In terms of the operational, <clears throat> of the technological uh, issues, I think that the, uh, for instance, the text to uh, 911, sure there are some issues with that. FCC has addressed, addressed some of that. There are about 10% of uh, PSAPs in the nation now that can um, receive text messages that does not include video, that does not include uh, pictures. 
um, thus changing about 30 percent of the uh, nation. Uh, about 30 percent of the states are equipped infrastructure-wise to progress to next generation 911. Um, about 50 percent of the states are not ready to progress to next generation 911. So there, there's some grants pending to help out with that, but that's still a technological gap that needs to, uh, to be addressed for sure. Jim, um, I, I have a perspective I think is relevant to your question. Um, as you well know as well, in big cities there is often a PSAP that is medically um, uh, very competent. Uh, they may or may not do police as well, but in the rural communities the vast majority, as you say, are uh, law enforcement based and they do the medical sort of on the side. I've always felt there's two parts to dispatch to a PSAP. Part one is the guy who answers the call and says police, fire, or medical, mm -hmm. and then they send the right vehicle to the right address. The second part of it on the medical dispatch is the caller uh, medical instructions, pre-arrival instructions. And I'm really interested in Drew's idea, because I thought of it before you did, by the way, um, <laughs> of regionalization, of having centers of excellence and with the push of a technological button, the guy who's in Communityville, Arkansas, sends out the right ambulance, gets them on the way, then pushes the button, and the experts take over for the pre-arrival instructions. I think technologically it's very doable. Thank you. And also that would address the police can still own the dispatch center issue. They don't really care that much about owning the medical side, in my opinion. Uh, Bob Newmar, University of Michigan, also a volunteer for AHA. Um, so my question was related to that, the concept, which I think is very intriguing, of regionalization of telecommunicator CPR instruction. And so I come from a state of Michigan where more than half of the PSABs don't give medical uh, command, uh, and they don't have ways even to transfer the call sometimes. So. The question is, what, what are the technological, right now, today, what are the technological and regulatory barriers of patching in, uh, rather than transferring the call, patch and then not having any more feedback with the provider or with the, the caller, but patching in a telecommunicator or CPR expert to give those instructions and maybe have one center in the whole state that can, can do that? What, what are the barriers to pulling that off? I think right now, uh, you know, I'm no technological expert, trust me, but I think right now it may well be able to be done um, simply by patching through. I think under next generation 911, it will be possible to do it much more quickly and easily and be able to transfer the call. And then as, um, as information comes in, um, in, in the future, as information comes in from smartphones and, and other wearable devices, then it may well be possible to seamlessly also transfer that data to a more technologically advanced uh, PSAP uh, to be able to interpret that data. And are there are there any potential regulatory issues if you know if some distant center, or other part of the state, or in a different state are providing those instructions? I don't know of any right off hand. Art. No, my guess would be different state, there probably is a problem. Yeah. We know there's huge obstacles even to basic telehealth across right. state lines. Within states, probably not. Probably not. Okay. But uh, I think you'd have to go back to Michigan and ask. I would add, through the DeSemso group, et cetera, the states are more and more aligning themselves and becoming partners, and I think those kind of issues could be worked through with agreements. Okay. Uh, Jen's next. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jennifer Chapp um, from Orlando and very lucky to be from Orlando. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments and first of all I wanted to say thank you very much. I actually am a lay rescuer who was able to perform dispatcher assisted CPR for this gentleman right here. Cool. And <laughs> And I just had to comment because I don't know how many people you talk to that have done it. And I, I would like to say that the human factor is super important. Um, I was all alone when this happened to my husband in our kitchen floor. And we were a team that morning. We were a team and 
I don't know that I could have done it without having that human factor with me. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to share, and one other, one other of you said that um, a lot of people don't get to see the outcomes. You know, we made a point to do that, and I, I just don't know how to make more people do that. Um, or, but we went and met the dispatcher. We went and met the six-man crew that revived him. We went to the hospital. We did a reunion tour uh, to see every single part of the hospital that he did. And we worked with the hospital to try to do a community video to try to help more people understand this issue that we didn't know anything about until till now. My question to you is, especially with the dispatcher assisted piece of it, do you reach out to people who have performed it to, to understand in terms of the quality measures, you know, what could have, what would have helped you more or less or those kinds of things? Do you ever reach out to people like me? Um, I'll take that briefly. Um, I personally don't, but I think that is commonly done in the communities where there is a great save like you did and you are to be so commended for being brave enough to do it. Um, I know the major dispatch agents or uh, companies that make the dispatch software have a lot of public outreach and feedback from uh, folks like yourself. So yes, I think it does get done, the feedback. There are some communities, for example, that uh, you know they will have a chain of survival ceremony where they will bring the dispatchers, the bystanders, and so on, and they actually do photo ops, then they hang them on their walls next to the bowling trophies or softball trophies. Or, but they see the saves pile up over a period of time. But during that period of time, they do ascertain what were you going through, what were your thoughts, how can we do it better next time for the next person? And that does, and that's a great model, and I think it should be adopted, something, things like that. So. I, I want to thank you for sharing that wonderful story. Yes. That's, we all need to hear that. It gets us all re-energized. You talked about the value of partnerships. I think there's a partnership that's implicit the last two days, but I want to make it explicit, and that is the partnership between highly competent, technically proficient managers of EMS systems, whether they're fire, private, third service, or otherwise, and competent, dedicated, well-educated, and trained medical direction. It ain't 911 and glossy fire trucks and great equipment and drugs. It's that partnership. It's emergency medical care. And we are in a nation's capital where today we have one of those, we don't really have the medical direction involvement. And that's been a long standing problem that Bob Davis talked about yesterday in that USA Today story. Many of the cities, this is a hypothesis because it's very hard to research where I think you can have one element or the other, you will not have the success. You won't have that top quartile or quintile survival rate. You've got to have a partnership. It's not one or the other, it's both. But if you don't have both, you will not have great saves like what you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Doug? Doug Kupas, Commonwealth EMS Medical Director for Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, I guess not really a disclosure, but just uh, a little background. I have uh, taught, as many people here, uh, ACLS for decades and have done uh, a number of things with the Heart Association with standards, et cetera. You know, the guidelines are terrific. There are over 400 pages. Most people don't read them. But one of the things that I didn't hear come up too much yesterday or today, and this speaks to Art's uh, point about the, you know, what, what happens in the quality of the high performance working, the cardiac arrest at the scene to get that ROSC and improve the survival, is that there's a culture issue, and this is not to malign any group, but there's this uh, decades of culture issue of uh, laying everything on a, a card. And, uh, you know, I think that we haven't done enough to, to push back against that. I think we, if you talk to nurses in hospitals, you know, the ACLS card and taking that course every two years is like the gold standard. If you look at many EMS systems, they require that all their paramedics have their ACLS card uh, every two years. But 
you know, that doesn't speak to the places that are getting the highest results are putting a lot of effort into things like pit crew training and, and more regular uh, training and education that is not necessarily around, you know, one of these cars. You, know, you take a look at ads for emergency physicians and to work in an emergency department, you know, you have to be board certified in emergency medicine, internal medicine, family medicine, and have an ACLS and PALS card. And, you know, we don't do that for anything else in medicine. And to some degree, that culture has so many people looking at that as the gold standard instead of these other things that improve um, hospital code team performance and EMS performance. And, you know, how do we get, uh, how do we get past that and really focus on the things that are going to get people working the arrest at the scene and not only working it at the scene until you get ROSC, but all of the things that help you get ROSC? So is that a rhetorical question, or, or you want someone to address Well, that? I, I think, you know, as several of the panelists, I mean, you know, Peter talked about the QI and, and Art about this, uh, you know, that is as an important component of this. Obviously, the dispatcher CPR, the bystander CPR are important, but then several times in the last two days, people talked about the importance of the high-performance CPR. Yeah. But, you know, we've got this culture issue of tying that to some educational card rather than got uh, Thanks, the program. All right. um, Bob? Bob Davis, a former reporter. Um, and um, thank you to this esteemed panel. Um, Dr. Kellerman's graph that showed the disparities over the years and where we're stuck to me represents thousands upon thousands of needlessly lost lives. So uh, we could fill a huge stadium with people who should be here based on why we're stuck. And to Jim's point that uh, we don't own dispatch, I believe that these are all tax-funded efforts, that uh, I believe that the public does own these systems and requires accountability. So I'm wondering, in, we're in a very scientific environment. This is a conversation similar to those that we've been in for decades. Uh, and I'm wondering, are there any obstacles for you all to demand accountability? I mean, I don't want to get the, you know, these lives matter thing going here, but it really is very frustrating to think about the thousands and thousands of thousands of people who have died needlessly while we've been having very similar discussions for decades. Let me do a reverse thing here. Let me ask you if you can, you know, give us a distilled version in a minute or so of what are the major factors, because you studied this specifically, and I don't think many of those things have changed. So about 10 years ago, you did an in-depth study. By the way, USA Today has never had a longer, you know, in terms of the number of words, three-part series, and it was like, what did you used to call it, uh, Art? You know, Long-form journalism. Huh? Yeah. Long-form journalism. Yeah. yeah. But what did you say about the quality of that thing? Oh, I, I think it's the best piece of media work done on emergency care ever. Yeah, exactly. Thank, thank you. So what did you, you studied in depth, and what were the, if you can give us three or four bullets of things that are missing that we should make priority? I mean, I think it's, I think it's survival. I think it's outcome. I think it's this bottom line, the, how those cities at the right end of the graph can be so different than those cities at the left end of the graph. I don't see how that's any longer after all these years, as we know from the IOM report on the chasm, 15, 17 years to implement something. Got it, but I'm pretty sure we're at that mark. So, you know, you can tell that I get a little animated about this because we keep talking about it, and I'm wondering what is going to make a difference. It is ironic. I know we all think that sports is a matter of life and death, but the average American has a much better handle on the, where their home team is in the major league standings than whether in the top half or the lower half of survival for out hospital cardiac arrest. Right. So, and the things I did take from that is that you have to measure it or you don't know, mm -hmm. and then the people who aren't measuring it generally aren't doing that well, and that's part of the problem. You've got to get past that. Two, there had to be strong medical direction, and not just a doctor, but someone who really knows what they're doing that can actually help direct all these things, make you know, or ensure that they're being done. That was that were some of the other uh, things that I picked up on that, and it sort of reflects what the panel was saying here today. Thank Let you. Let me move on, Nisha. Uh, Bob, uh, yeah, sure. just yeah. one the, Bob, I also think that, <clears throat> by and large, people. I mentioned this yesterday in the meeting. I don't think that people recognize that this is a public health problem. 
I think we all here say that this is a public health problem, but I don't believe that public health knows that this is a public health problem. Hmm. And I think the way that we do that is by one, having specific performance parameters, by having specific data, but then also by working with public health very closely and by working with the media very closely to make this become a public health issue. It's, it's a scientific issue for us now, but I don't know that it is really a public health issue in public health circles, and I don't think it is. To, to so it's kind of an epidemic of unnecessary deaths. Yeah, well, yeah. to paraphrase a former Surgeon General of the U.S., uh, if it's not a public health problem, why are so many people dying from it? <laughs> right. So, this is the easier way. Uh, Chandra Strobos from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Allow me to please uh, applaud a great session, but also to sort of take to um, the street exactly what Dr. Kellerman said, that you have to have great EMS systems, you have to have great uh, EMS directors, medical directors, but if I may share with you a very simple model that with the help of Kevin Seaman, who has been a, a fabulous partner and is sitting up there, we decided that if we want our paramedics to be better, we have to take part in training them. So we have set up a, a bipronged system by which every time there is an arrest or at least a STEMI that is coming in, we are posting in the ED the outcome of that STEMI. Within 24 hours, the cath of that STEMI is posted. It feeds into uh, the competitiveness of the VS various EMS systems as to door to balloon time was such and such, way to go, station six. Here, here. And uh, then, of course, station nine sort of takes it very personally. <laughs> but the other thing that we are doing is all the regional EMS meetings are happening at the hospitals and the physicians are there to teach, learn, and rather than teaching from an esoteric topic, uh, we choose now, and I personally do most of them, I choose to take one of the cases that the EMS transported, whatever it be, uh, be it an arrest, be it a STEMI that had an arrest, um, and we discuss it in terms of what was good, where were the opportunities for improvement, and we now have field activations and door to balloon times of 21 minutes. Nice. That makes a difference. Thank you. Uh, we have like three minutes, so I'm going to have to. Ken Shepke, I'm the EMS Medical Director of Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. I just want to speak to Dr. Kellerman's remark that we can do this in 24 months. I can tell you with a team of dedicated EMS medical directors, we more than doubled the survival rate in a system of 1.4 million people in three months. We know what to do. We just need to have the action to do it. The best slide I saw was the one with the thinker and the doer. We need to have a lot more doers because we know what to do. Great. Amen. Yeah, Lance Becker from Northwell Health. And I'd like to ask the panel sort of a question in terms of what do they think in terms of data and the barrier between data that is public and data that can be private and concealable? And so the, the question that I have is that we, we think of our EMS systems as being funded by public. I know Bob Davis did a great report that relied on getting access to data, yet so much of our data right now, because it's not really held by a federal agency, is quite concealable. And um, by that, what I really mean is, for example, you know, the American Heart Association has various databases, and those databases would indeed show hospitals that probably would not want to be identified. And so a question is, is that, is that reasonable? So is that reasonable that they would not be identified in the same way the CARES database and Art showed a perfect slide that showed, if you will, uh, EMS agencies that are clearly not doing well, EMS agencies that are doing fabulous, yet those agencies are quite anonymous. And that, that is not in the public purview. 
And so my question to the panel is what is the appropriate balance between data that would be public versus data that would be private and concealable? Well, one thought I have is that uh, about 14, 15 years ago, uh, Bill Barson and I helped the NIH run a panel on how to do, set up stroke centers and so on. And there was so much controversy at that time. Well, within five, six, seven years later, it's now a JACO is, re, uh, is reviewing it. And part of that was EMS driving and saying, if you want us to take stroke patients to you, uh, you need to give us these data, how fast you do this, how fast you get, you know, whatever it might be. And that didn't necessarily have to be released, but the, to the EMS system, you know, which was part of it, they could do. So uh, other efforts are going on. I think Ken, who you just saw, is doing similar efforts, for example, is setting up currently, and others have done it already in other places around the resuscitation centers. So part of it is that we have to know how, you know, what your care was, and you gave parameter and data, and not only outcome data, but how, you, how fast you got to the cath lab or how fast you, um, you know, in certain cases. So that may be one solution. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Well, I would say that at the point we're at today, most of these uh, registries, for example, CARES is completely voluntary. As a matter of fact, it actually costs money to send your, money, your, your data to CARES and get feedback. Um, I don't think at this point if agencies knew their data was going to be posted on a federal website or a city state website, they would be as inclined to participate. I think at this early juncture, it makes sense to let them see their own data and then comparison data so they can yeah. improve and want to improve. And then later on, they'll advertise themselves when they get better. There's no question about it. Um, I see the argument for the public having access to all of this data, but I think you have to be careful. It could become counterproductive, especially early on in these efforts. So I'm supposed to have wrapped up by now, but I think it's really worthwhile having uh, Dr. Juliette Saucy here cut to the microphone. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. Juliette Saucy, former EMS medical director in New Orleans and the District of Columbia. I want to echo my EMS colleagues' sentiments, and I want to more or less make a statement. Is this on? Can you hear me? And that is we have powerful, the elephant in the room here, we have powerful forces, both unions and politicians, that manage to direct the practice of medicine each and every day. It is untenable, and it will not change unless there is a call to arms from both the medical community and the community at large. So my question for all of us is, are we ready to do this? because we cannot have non-medical practitioners telling us how to practice emergency medical care in the streets of the nation, the United States of America. So again, I just challenge all of us, it, this is the time to act. And my EMS colleagues, I hope we can band together and, and, and make that unacceptable. Thank you. All right. So that's a great segue to set up the tone for our breakout sessions that we're going to have. Uh, many of you know where your breakout sessions are going to be. Uh, you actually have a transition period here, I think, of uh, a, a during which you can pick up lunches and so on. And uh, then we'll be back here, I think, shortly afternoon to go through these reports in general from the breakout sessions. Thank you very much for this morning. Thanks to our panel. What a great job they did today. So yeah, appreciate it.